they had something called Mary's Day, which ended up being a celebration. So I think a lot of people think this is a protest, but it's a celebration to bring awareness, which what a great concept. And their focus was world hunger. Well, I think when you talk about Karita's work and how special it truly is, it's looking at the future generations that can pull from her work. I think that her pieces are as relevant today as they were when she created them. Oh, the rules! Pick your favorite rule. <laughs> People tend to really resonate with this. I think a lot of artists really resonate with this. She asked her students, like, what is important to you in both a teacher and your role as a student? She took from that and created the 10 rules. And people tend to have a favorite rule or what they're drawn to or whatever speaks to them that day or what is what they needed to hear. Rule one, find a place you trust and then try trusting it for a while. Rule two, general duties of a student. Pull everything out of your teacher. Pull everything out of your fellow students. Rule three, general duties of a teacher. Pull everything out of your students. Rule four, consider everything an experiment. Rule five, be self-disciplined. Discipline has to do with being a disciple. This means finding someone wise or smart and choosing to follow them. To be disciplined is to follow in a good way. in the 1960s. Graphic designers were trying to distinguish themselves from commercial artists. Then you have somebody like Sister Carita who has a real desire for the church to like reach out and help the community, bringing in all kinds of public figures and all of the art and design community that's happening here in Los Angeles. There's a great book which I'll pass around and you can take a look at. And there's one statement in it which is from the Balinese. They say, we have no art. We do everything as well as we can. See, so that you, you don't have art off in a little niche someplace. You, you have no distinction between what is art and what is not art. You do everything as well as you can. Krita was always an artist. There's these wonderful stories of her as a child with her family and her father kind of always pushing her to think outside of the box. She was part of the Immaculate Heart College, but she also was a nun. She was born Frances Kent, but she actually took on the name Carita, which means little heart. From the time she joined the order, she was known as Sister Mary Carita. And what is really unique too for the time period is that she went to school for art as well. She actually got her master's from USC. She was the head of the art department there at the Immaculate Heart College, which was sort of the epicenter for a lot of forward thinkers and a lot of her work is inspired by the conversations that happened there. She had a lot of influences that were coming from New York because of Andy Warhol, but she also had local artists like Charles and Ray Eames, and the mentorship she had, especially with Charles Eames, really influenced her way of sort of thinking about a kind of visual freedom. She sees Andy Warhol. She goes, wow, everyday art, you know, the stuff that's in like grocery stores. And she sees these graphics that are coming from the everyday. And she begins to see these messages as particularly ones that she can use. A work of art makes you alert to what you hadn't noticed in the ordinary things so that the distinction narrows between what is ordinary and what is extraordinary. In the 60s, you see her work take a turn. It becomes a little more about the typography. So Sister Carita really begins to look at the commercial use of graphics, sees how bold they are, and begins to flip that on its head and actually use those instrumentally in very different kinds of messages. One of the ways that she did that is by taking 
imagery, taking lettering, taking text and messages from everyday life, from street signs, from uh, newspapers, uh, from packaging and advertising, and uh, reworking them to, to actually create new messages. Creator who didn't have digital technology would take type and actually wrap it around boxes to create a dimensional shape and then photograph them and make that a flat thing that she would then get onto a screen print. So she's thinking about language and the way that we communicate with one another, but then also just finding beauty in the typography and the way that those letters lay on that paper and then the way that she's layering them. A serigraph is a silk screen print. The word serigraph means drawing on silk and you form your stencil on the silk and print through that scent densel. So you're printing through the silk onto a piece of paper. You know, she's physically manipulating this text in a way that's really kind of groundbreaking. By taking stencils and moving them and reshaping them so that they have this wavy kind of distorted effect, you really kind of broke free of that grid. You broke free of this era of modernism out of the 50s and the early 60s where everything was really structured, very rigid. When I look at Sister Corita Kent's work, it's so beautiful and sometimes it's so simple. When people look at how she mixed photographs and lettering and color and montage, her stuff blows your mind. Sister Creed is often lumped in with other pop artists. That's true on an aesthetic sense, but I think that her work had such deep messages within it. Corita's work is playful and powerful at the same time. There aren't many other designers that can do that. There's a pretty famous uh, print of hers where she is uh, actually referencing the packaging of Wonder Bread. Inside of the circles, she has written in a quote from Gandhi. There are so many hungry people, basically, and this idea that there could be the possibility to feed them all. And this sort of commercial image of bread gets adopted by Korea to be this revolutionary message that is talking about feeding and sustaining people, but is also referencing her experience as a Catholic nun and the Christian image of breaking bread as a spiritual and symbolic expression of nourishing humanity. Sometimes you can take the whole of the world in and sometimes you need a small piece to take in. And I, I think that's really what, what a work of art is even though we don't have works of art anymore. It's a small piece that you can digest, which gives you a kind of idea of the richness that is in the whole. She had this practice that she would do with her students called a viewfinder. She would have the students hold up the viewfinder as an exercise in cropping and sort of looking at gas station signs or like the grocery store or supermarket. And I think there's something about the visual landscape of Los Angeles, of Southern California, that would inspire her and her students. She was a teacher first and then an artist. A lot of her writing is about creating a space in which students felt comfortable and free and open to experiment. She was all about opening up the mind to new ways of thinking and seeing the world. Part of her work and what she was interested in was also putting her graphics, not just in her screen prints and her seriographs, but also organizing parades, demonstrations, marches with her students where they would sort of perform their graphics in public space as a kind of reflection back on the turmoil and the dynamism and the possibility that was happening specifically in Los Angeles. So if you can think of Hollywood in the late 60s as a very groovy time, but also really um, there's a lot of turbulent things happening here in California. And there's some calm in the chaos in the conversations that she was partaking with some of these forward thinkers. Uh, what does change mean? Uh, what does hope mean? What does social justice? And you see that in a lot of her pieces, particularly in the 60s. They seem to be a direct reaction to what's happening in Los Angeles. She was moved 
by the anti-war movement, by the social justice movement. She had a very unique style that she brought to the table. It took a while for her artwork to penetrate a broader social justice movement, but it did. The Watts uprising occurs and she takes the cover of the Los Angeles Times, which essentially blames the African American community. She flips that on its side and then includes a quote from a gentleman that had been marching in Selma at that time. So it's a real direct reaction. It's one of her first pieces that she starts uh, almost in a way reporting what's happening in the world. And she particularly gets politically activated about the Vietnam War. And her work begins to change from spiritual messages into very political messages. A yellow submarine. <laughs> this is actually what this is titled, this yellow submarine. Here you'll see uh, Vietnam flipped on its side and you can see the text slightly broken. And then here you have the Lennon-McCartney lyric that she attributes to them. I think printmaking was a almost conceptual practice for her. How do you get your ideas out into the world as fast as possible? And the fact that their paper is really democratic. You know, not everybody feels comfortable going into a museum or a gallery. It feels like maybe a language that you don't know how to speak. Here's somebody who kind of demystifies that to some degree, and I think that speaks to a lot of her ethos that she exhibited through her lifetime of accessibility through art. Short and instructive as a work of art is, I think it was Shaw who said that art is the only thing that can educate painlessly. One of the things that's exciting about her work is that it allows people of all different types to be engaged with art and graphic design. And a lot of her legacy was making this kind of work accessible, not just to the people who are viewing it, but those who might want to make it. Part of the legacy of what Sister Creator was doing at Immaculate Heart was somebody like Sister Karen, who goes on to start self-help graphics. So Sister Karen was a student of Sister Creator Kent. Sister Karen invented the Barrio Mobile, where they would bring screen printing to communities that didn't necessarily have the best access to education. They were helping groups in Los Angeles that didn't have the best access to art or any other resources, but they sure had a lot to say. You know, here's this incredibly innovative uh, way of engaging community that these artists were creating in the 70s. That approach to working with community is something that's so uh, critical and core to what self-help graphics is. Well, essentially, we were a part of the Chicano art movement. So it was a way of expressing the culture and who the artists were through their visual images. So in the early 70s, um, you, you have a community that is experiencing the East LA walkouts, uh, which was an incredible student movement had just happened here on the east side. The Chicano moratorium had just happened. So there's a lot of communal trauma that's being experienced um, on a national level, right? We're dealing with the uh, Vietnam War. And here locally, there's a lot happening on the east side. Um, the Chicano community as a whole, I think, is feeling uh, various forms of oppression. And so that is the context that self-help graphics comes up in. And Sister Karen, as a Franciscan nun, I think saw an opportunity and interestingly actually had to convince her order that self-help graphics was a form of fulfilling her spiritual mission. I think she was really able to make the argument that art is life and this has to be part of people's lives um, and this is the service that we are, we are bringing to, to the community and that's then how it fulfills her mission. It was like bringing art into life and making art part of life which I think is really the critical element that we have as an example from the Chicano art movement, that art isn't just something that somebody teaches out of a book or that only a few people practice. Art is a part of life. 
I mean, really just understanding art and culture as being critical to somebody's everyday life is absolutely part of what Sister Karen imbued on the organization. And I do see that influence in terms of her connection to being a sister of Corita Kent and having that understanding and approach to engaging community on a broader level. Welcome guys. It's really nice that you came. We've prepared some things um, to do with you. How many of you have heard about Corita Kent before? The more I got engaged into her work, the more I got interested in her pedagogy, because this is really what drives the fact that the work is for everyone. You can't talk about Corita without talking about her pedagogies, the way that she shaped community inside of her classroom and outside in the world is something that is reverberating through design education right now. I absolutely think that the influence of Corita is very much present in what self-help graphics was in those earlier years, but I think even now, um, nearly 50 years later, there's absolutely ripple effects. I need just a bit more ink, so if you want to grab a little bit from here. So Self-Help Graphics today is you know, still continuing that printmaking legacy and, and to prove that that is possible, the way that Sister Karen had set out, um, while holding space for um, you know, the broader community and the community at large. Part of what I think is important about the connection between Sister Corita and Sister Karen, who started Self-Help Graphics, is this matrilineal lineage of design education. What is that ripple effect in the world when you have these important historical figures, specifically women in history, and I, I really truly believe that Krita was one of those. I think that's actually something that's a huge part of California, that women have been pioneers and leaders in design education, and Krita is a main fixture of this sort of image of activism and design history and design making in California. Rule six, nothing is a mistake. There is no win and no fail. There is only make. Rule seven, the only rule is work. If you work, it will lead to something. It's the people who do all of the work all of the time who eventually catch on to things. Rule eight, don't try to create and analyze at the same time. There are different processes. Rule nine, be happy whenever you can manage it. Or as the ad says, enjoy yourself. It's lighter than you think. And finally, in John Cage's words, we're breaking all the rules, even our own rules. And how do we do that? By leaving plenty of room for X quantities. This program was made possible in part by City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, LA County Department of Arts and Culture, and the California Arts Council.